Hello, everybody. Hello, welcome to the 2018 um, Science Lecture Series at the University of California, Riverside. Uh, I'm Francie Sladek, the Divisional Dean of Life Sciences in the College of Natural and Agricultural Sciences. As many of you know, this is a series that's organized primarily by the CNAS, the College of Natural and Agricultural Sciences. This is our 11th year. Um, we started in uh, 2009. The title of the series this year, as you see, is Gene Editing, Are We Playing God? Uh, perhaps a bit of a provocative title, but I think it all got you in here, so I'm glad it worked. Right. Um, first, I there, there's going to be four lectures in this series, as you see up here. The first is uh, today, uh, The Hope and Threat of Human Gene Editing. I'll introduce the speaker in a minute. The next one is next week, Feeding the World from Mendel to CRISPR, where we're going to be talking about gene editing with this exciting new method called CRISPR-Cas9. Um, today, Dr. Garcia Castro is going to talk about it in humans, and next week, Dr. Carolyn Rasmussen will talk about this technique and other forms of gene editing in plants. And then the third lecture on April 19th, um, Dr. Ansel Sow, a new member of the UCR community, We'll be talking about gene editing in bacteria. And then the fourth lecture is going to be on May 10. And this is going to be given by Professor Carl Craner, who's a professor of philosophy. And he's going to be t focusing on some of the ethical issues involved with gene editing. And hence the title, um, Gene Editing, Are We Playing God? At the fourth series, we'll have all three speakers, and we'll have a panel, and we'll have an, uh, an opportunity for extensive discussion uh, among the, par the participants as well as the audience. So I'm hoping that you can make all four lectures. So I'd also, I'd like to acknowledge UCR College of Natural, Natural and Agricultural Sciences who organizes this. We've been planning this actually since about last August. So we're very excited it's finally underway. I'd also like to acknowledge KBCR 91.9 for their support for the series as well as CAFE, the California California Agricultural and Food Enterprise. It's an umbrella organization at UCR, um, have everything having to do with food and agriculture. I'd also like to acknowledge some people in the audience today, um, Chancellor Kim Wilcox, okay. and I think that's his wife, and his wife, okay. Um, but we have a few other divisional deans in the audience, but I won't call them out. Um, I, we also have several UCR faculty I see. I see graduate students, I see undergraduates, so thank you all very much for coming. I'd also like to acknowledge the UCR science ambassadors, and we, I see some in the back. They've got the orange, the, sorry, the blue polo shirts on. You want to wave your hands? So um, we've got some down here, down here and in the back. So these are some of our top undergraduates. They have to um, apply to become a UCR ambassador. They're interviewed by several divisional deans. Um, that might be scary enough to turn anyone away, but they're very accomplished speakers, and they help us with all of our events. So we're very happy to have them here. So as we said, the uh, talk tonight is The Hope and Threat of Human Gene Editing, and given by Associate Professor Martin Garcia Castro. He received his PhD in um, 1996 at the University of Cambridge in Developmental Biology. He's an associate professor at the UCR School of Medicine, and he's also the associate director of the UCR Stem Cell Center. He came to UCR in 2014, so he's also a relatively new um, faculty member on campus. So would you all please uh, uh, join me in welcoming Dr. Uh, Martin Garcia Castro to the stage. Thank you very much. I hope the mic is working and you can hear me. I want to welcome you and thank you for coming and joining me today. I want to ask for some hands up just to see if we have any alumni here tonight. Great. Thank you very much. Is there anybody else that is neither a student nor a faculty nor an alumni, but is a member of the community that is engaged in these topics tonight? Excellent. Thank you very much. It is a real pleasure for me to discuss with you this new exciting development in biology. It's a major breakthrough that has 
the capacity to fundamentally change life as we know it. And I think it's our obligation to inform, discuss, ad nauseum until we explore every possibility before we engage uh, any further. So it's a pleasure to talk to you about CRISPR today. CRISPR is a very peculiar name. It's a specific defense system that arises in bacteria a while back. This system allows the bacteria to defend themselves against viruses. In the ocean, it is estimated that about 40% of the bacterial population die every day in the hands of viruses. And so bacteria have developed this nice, intricate system to prevent these attacks by viruses. It's a specific shield that is composed of a system very sophisticated that we call today CRISPR, CRISPR Cas9 that delivers a molecule with a global positioning system, a GPS, a navigator, and scissors that allows it to cut specifically the sequence of an invader DNA from a virus if it has a registry of that particular virus. It will cut it in a particular sequence of the virus leading to a change. The change occurs through natural mechanisms of repair. So it's simply the capacity to cut very specifically where you need, where you want, that helps us. So now you have a change in sequence right here from the original ATGCG to an AAGCG. And that change might be sufficient to destroy the virus. It might be that you just cut it and degrade it. It might be that you cut it and modify it, and now it cannot um, destroy the bacteria. So this is an amazing tool to modify DNA, and that has now evolved to a point that allows us to engineer changes in the DNA. So what is important is to decide for what purposes could we use this technology? Where should we use it? How has it been used already? And try to explore if there's any risks, and if there are, then we should address them. And then, Face it, as we've done every time we've had these fantastic opportunities with new technologies and developments, and make a better future. So our history of life started a long, long time ago in a beautiful planet that had the environment properties for life to appear. It's a very, very delicate system in which many different forms have arised. These forms are all intricately linked by the DNA molecule. So we can see in this depiction of a tree of life, the arise of bacteria, the first ones to appear, then the archibacteria a little bit later, and then all the eukaryote. And so all of these different species arose in the earth under specific conditions, and all of them are linked through the DNA that regulates the appearance of functions at different specific times and in different cells. This is from the old Cosmos series with Carl Sagan, where he uh, depicts evolution of all of these species and how they are related. It's one of my favorites. So the key thing for me is that all of these beautiful organisms are all rooted in the same structure, in the DNA, that has been changing little by little uh, to lead to all of these different species, providing different functions. How does that happen? Well, the DNA is composed by four bases, right? So you have C, A, G, and T. And these bases, as simple as it sounds, just four, can be repeated in multiple different sequences that convey information in a very unique way. These are in charge of both inheritance and function. The inheritance uh, can be very easily seen by the ability of these bases to pair in a specific way. So you can see here the C, G, A, T, G, C, A, T sequence that is found in that chain of DNA is paired 
each one of the bases, the C has three hydrogen bonds that pair it with the G. The A has two hydrogen pairs that pairs it with the T. So these complementarity, this ability of the bases to seek the complement, the A with the T, the G with the C, allows you to then copy the sequence that you have initially here generated in the opposite direction, right? And you ha have a sequence that seems different, but in fact, it's a mold, a precise mold of the original sequence, such that if you were to lose or separate the initial copy, now just by pairing the bases, you can generate the original sequence. And this is really the basis of heredity, and this is the basis of how our new cells generate other daughter cells, right? So it's fundamental function of the DNA that allows us to have this inheritance, and it is also in this code of DNA that we have found the encryption of the function of life. Because the sequence of DNA codes proteins. It makes first a cousin of the DNA called RNA, the mRNA, and then it's read to generate proteins that have function. So from the DNA, we copy by complementarity these bases in a specific sequence, and then that RNA is read into a specific protein. And this protein has a function. It's a molecular machine within each one of our cells with a unique function. And all of our cells have a particular shape and capacity and appearance due to the proteins that they contain. These proteins were made because the DNA coded the instructions for these proteins to be delivered in a particular cell. So these are the building, building blocks of life. They convey specific functions. So if we think simply on our eye, right? It has many different cell types, and each one of them is going to have the same DNA, but that is regulating the function through the proteins that it makes. So you have different cells, each one of them with a specific function and mission that is fundamental for the operation of the eye. So you have different sequences, different proteins, and that leads to different functions. And that variety essentially is at the root of the diversity that we have, as I said from the beginning. And so it turns out that this DNA variation has been occurring from the get-go. We had original sequences that coded from a for a bacteria, and little by little it was changed through evolution, and little by little it became another organism or another bacteria, or it evolved further. But beyond what nature has done to modify the DNA, humans have been able to also modify and engineer the DNA for a long time. A very nice example is uh, this wild banana that has nothing to do with what we enjoy today in our table, right? And this happened without knowing, without us knowing the fundamental mechanism of operation of this gene engineering, right? We simply started to select the plants that we liked and, and grew those and tried to allow them or help them to replicate. And the same has happened with animals that we have domesticated, right? So you have a wolf, and now we have an enormous range of different dogs that have very little resemblance to the original wolf. And this was not done by us providing a specific new age molecular tools to engineer the wolf, right? We just did it. How did we get there? We got there through the help of fantastic men and women that put a lot of effort in understanding life and understanding biology. And it's incredibly difficult, it's impossible to go through all of them. But of course, I have to mention Mendel because he laid down the foundation of inheritance, right? And then there's a lot of people that put a lot of effort in understanding what was the essence of that inheritance, right? What was conveying the information? And probably amongst my favorites is Rosalind Franklin, right? Who was the first one to truly view the double helix and understand it, right? But there's many more people that have helped in this path. And today we have a really good understanding of how this works. Right? So a lot of people have participated in this, and now we have uh, 
a very good grasp of biology, right? And we're confronted today with this CRISPR that I mentioned initially, and we want to know what is it? How does it work? And how could we use it, right? So I mentioned initially that it is a defense system established by bacteria. How does it operate? A virus can try to come into a bacteria, and once it gets in, it injects its DNA, it attaches to the membrane, it injects its DNA, and its DNA, it's essentially gonna uh, hijack the bacterial system, replicate many, many times until the poor bacteria explodes. And this happens to the vast majority of bacteria. However, they have a chance. They develop this CRISPR mechanism. So most of the bacteria infected with the virus, shown here in purple, will simply become a factory for more viruses and succumb to the attack and be destroyed. As I said, some of them have developed the possibility to shield them, to fend them off. And it's not a really true depiction because it's not preventing the attachment or the injection of the DNA into the bacteria. In fact, what it's doing is allowing the virus DNA to go in and then recognizing it and destroying it. So we look at the bacteria here. It has a little piece of DNA that is slightly different that I put here in pink. I don't know if you can all recognize it easily. But that little pink the piece of DNA was stored by a bacteria that survived an infection by a virus that I'm going to call pink this time. Right? So next time another pink virus comes by, the bacteria uses a surveillance system that is armed with the identity of the pink virus amongst other things, which is CRISPR. That's what it allows. So if it has the pink shield, it could recognize that virus. The sequence of the DNA from the virus, it ends up in the bacterial chromosome. When the bacteria survives the attack of a virus, it chops the virus in multiple pieces, and it has a specific location in its chromosome where it can locate sequences, little pieces from the viruses. And it's a, a little repertoire, a little library of viruses that can, have come and are all stored in this particular location that is a cluster of regulatory <coughs> interspace short palindromic repeats. So it's a very cumbersome name, and that's why we go by CRISPR, right? It's much easier to refer to it. But I think it's easy to grasp the idea that each one of these pieces correspond to DNA sequence that is unique for a specific virus. And if you have a sequence specific for that virus, then you can target it. But up until now, all I've said is that they have the DNA sequence for the virus. So how do they destroy it? The way CRISPR works is that these little pieces are transcribed into RNAs that are further processed such that you can ensemble a very specific guillotine or scissors to go and attack the virus. This is made in part by the protein Cas, which is a protein associated with the CRISPR locus. They are expressed nearby the locus. And this Cas9 is armed with the RNA from that particular region, in this case from the green one. But you could envision that this bacteria is going to ensemble a series of Cas proteins with each one of the bits from different viruses, and it has them all the time. So the bacteria on its normal life has Cas engaged with one of these pieces for some of the possible viruses that has seen in its history or its uh, predecessors. So in this little movie, you can see the viral attack in a more effective way. So you have several viruses, it injects its DNA, and if it's not successful, it's gonna be destroyed, so the bacteria survive, and grab a piece of that DNA from the virus and inserts it into the CRISPR locus, and you can see several of those right there. These come from the viruses. And then the bacteria is gonna make RNA from that locus, is going to process each one of the pieces to generate the matches for each one of the virus, and it needs the assistance of other RNAs that will ensemble together with Cas9. This is a tracer RNA in the first place, 
And now you have the cas protein with the two RNAs, and these proteins are going to be surveilling the whole bacterial chromosome all the time, trying to see if they find a match. And if they do find a match, then they will cut that DNA, which will lead most of the time to the degradation of the virus. So this is how the system works to cut the DNA. But I mentioned before that part of the engineering is that we can now modify to our will, right? So that's actually another gift from nature. It turns out that when you cut DNA in our cells, we have systems that naturally try to repair those cuts. And there's two different ways to cut. Here you have a representation of a cut of a DNA. And in that cut DNA, you have a few options. In one hand, you can try to repair that sequence, or you can try to delete that sequence. So you can see in these fragment, you're missing the yellow segment that was here. And in this fragment, instead, you have extra bases that did not exist originally. Alternatively, you could provide the cell with an additional piece of DNA that could match perfectly well in that location, either by homology or simply because it's a cut DNA that fits right there. And this system works incredibly well. So we're very lucky. Our biology provided a system to repair the cuts, and now we have found that bacteria have developed these shields mechanism that allow you to direct the cutting enzyme wherever you want. So I've mentioned until now just one bacteria, and it turns out that CRISPR comes in many flavors. There are many different genes involved, and it varies by species, but they are a wide gamut. And the one that we use more widely today is Cas9, but there's many of these that have slightly different functionalities, specificities, or requirements. And that has opened up the world. So this is how the enzyme looks. In white, you have Cas9. You have the DNA here in blue. You have the guiding RNA here. And it's going to cut the DNA right in between. So it's like a clam or like an old Pac-Man that is going to recognize the specific sequence of DNA and cut it. So this is the one that we most uh, broadly use, Cas9. And one of the most remarkable feasts had been to discover uh, this system that was in bacteria can be now placed into any organism and it works. There has not been one report where it has failed, which is incredibly surprising and powerful, right? Because now you can direct the cuts wherever you want. And if you can direct the cuts, then you can direct the repairs. The repairs may fix or remove or add things at will. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> Sorry. So thanks to this, thanks to this technology, we really are at a major uh, crossroad of discovery, where we have found a new tool that can allow us to modify the fabric of life. Right? This is not an exaggeration. We've seen many discoveries before. As I said, we have been able to modify genomes in the past, but never have we been able to do it so fast, so effectively, so cheap, so apparently accessible to everybody. So with these facilities that it provides, it also brings uh, some risks, right? And we need to understand to how far are we going to go with this technology, right? So this is not the first time that we've been in a technological breakthrough. Uh, amongst my fa favorites, of course, is to think about how we tame the fire and what uses did we, uh, you, did we put it to, right? So we, first of all, use it to cook, then we use it to lit up our houses, and then we trap it and put it into engines that have allowed us to do wonderful things. And you could also think of terrible things that we've done with it, right? It's just a tool. So I trust that we're smart enough 
like many other wonderful, exemplary people that have led our communities in the past that have allowed us to do wonderful things, right? We went to the moon. We have a better understanding of our cosmos, of our universe, right? So the question, the key question here is, what should we be doing with this fabulous tool? And one of the uh, most pressing uses that one could imagine is to help humans that either are suffering today or that will be suffering. And amongst the candidates on the list, there are these monogenetic diseases. There are diseases caused by a change in one gene. It's either a small mutation that prevents the function or that superactivates the function and leads to the disease. And I'm sure that anybody here who were to receive the news that a dear one is about to be born with a disease prone gene will be tempted to at least think about the possibility to remove this burden from those individuals, right? So this is something that we need to think really hard because a couple of years ago, it was a dream. Today, this is a reality. It is happening. What other uses could we have? We can tackle more complex diseases. We could think of cancers, right? Where there's multiple genes operating. And in those conditions, maybe the way to help the individual are perhaps a little bit more accessible, both uh, in a, um, a healthy way for our um, moral compass, because we don't have to modify the individual permanently. We can take cells from the, the sick person and then modify them outside of the individual and put them back. And these cells have a span life, a limited span life, right? We could also think that this will be an incredible tool to go and modify vectors of diseases like malaria. So if we can go and prevent the mosquito from acquiring malaria to begin with, then it could not spread it, right? And this is something that has been done in the past with other technologies, so it, it seems relatively easy to access. We could also develop new antibiotics, and this is critical in our time because we are so familiar to the multi-resistance of several strains, right? We could use it, as was mentioned in the introduction by Francine, to improve our food sources, to make food better or acquire it faster or cheaper, right? As I said before, some of these technologies are already in place to address several diseases, either for sickle cell anemia, like in this example, but I'm sure you're familiar with the cases of leukemia in which patients have already received modified cells. The first ones were not edited or engineered by CRISPR, but the new ones are coming CRISPR modified, offering to do it faster, more effectively. We can also think of diseases, neurodegenerative diseases, many of these, in which we could prevent the disease by modifying the gene on time. And there's already several attempts to tackle several of those. In this image, you can see a section of half of a brain that is healthy and that one half that is severely damaged by Huntington's disease. They're not from the same individual, obviously. And examples like these, like Huntington's, are diseases that are triggered exclusively by this one gene, Huntington, right? And a little change there could prevent this degener degenerative disease. And there's many other examples in which this technology is already being used. HIV, as I mentioned, cancer, like the leukemia that I mentioned before. So we need to keep thinking in which other directions this is going to go. Some people have suggested that if it is so easy to use this technology, maybe we could start thinking about enhancing our life. And when I wake up and I feel my toes hurting and I'm only 53, I wish I could do something to alleviate it, right? I, it's not that I'm 20 anymore. So is there a chance that I could do something like that or that somebody will come with a remedy to make my aging a little bit more manageable? Is there a possibility that we could simply provide humans with a 
higher stature or with more muscle or with a better immune system, how much are we going to push in that direction, right? <laughs> so if you put these muscle gene and GFP, <laughs> what would you end up with, right? I wonder. And is it going to be good or not, right? So the thing is that CRISPR has gone completely wild in our society. And I don't know if all of you have heard. Can I have a hands up for who has not heard of CRISPR before today? I would say a third at most have not heard about it. It's really incredible. So these two superheroes heroes from Netflix are both modified by CRISPR. The new version of X-Files has uh, aliens designing a virus by CRISPR to annihilate the human race. J-Lo is featuring a major TV show with CRISPR at the center of the story. You could also go to the dark side and start to contemplate the fiction that we've enjoyed and celebrated for many years. Here, two of my favorites in which we could see a very dark future if we let these two get out of the box without thinking about how we're going to use it. Who will have access to it and how much are we going to do? And of course, you could go really dark and think eugenics. That has been tried in humanity and we've seen the results. And it's not a fiction, right? So I want to pause a little bit and just to think about unknown effects. So I told you that this is formidable because we can go and tackle the gene of a particular function and change it for what we want. And that's absolutely true. And I also told you that we've gained an enormous amount of knowledge about the biology of life. But we don't know everything. We cannot kid ourselves. A recent report, for instance, established that we had about between 20 and 25,000 proteins. And it's, it was a surprise that there were that few number of proteins in a human being. More recent reports argue that there's a much larger number of proteins, but that were so small that we're not even considered. So it might be that we have three to five times as many but we just don't know yet. And these are serious reports that have come not from one lab, but from now a group of scientists that is dedicated to study this, right? For a long time, we thought that the DNA was laden with garbage DNA, with trash DNA. Now we know that there's a ton of sequence that is dedicated to regulate the expression of the genes. So how freely should we play with this tool when we still don't understand a vast majority of the genetic space. The last cautionary tale comes from a, a very um, interesting, appealing, and scary approach. I mentioned before that we could try to use CRISPR to control vectors of disease, like the mosquito and malaria. But some scientists went one step further and realized that if we just modify one mosquito, that cannot contain, that cannot receive malaria and release it in nature, its benefits are going to last as long as its life, right? The progeny of this mosquito is going to receive the mosquito, the, the malaria benevolent genes from the partner. So they thought one way to prevent this will be by doing gene drive, in which they're going to introduce not only the scissors with the navigator, but they're going to introduce the genes for the scissors and the navigator into the mosquito, allowing the inheritance of the system to all the new generations. And you say, wow, no malaria ever again, right? Fantastic. What if it goes wrong? What if now mutations occur that change the destiny of the guide RNA and you cut somewhere else? What if actually? simply because you block the entrance of malaria, you allow another pathogen to come in that we didn't think, right? So the unknowns are very large. 
But when you think of delivering the system by gene drive to other organisms, you're tampering in a major, major way with the unknowns. It's not only that we don't know the function, but it's a little bit curious to me that these systems have not been found in eukaryotes. They're not in the mammals. Why, if they were such a good system to prevent the virus infection, is not there. And I'm not saying that they're wrong, but it's curious that through evolution, somehow we come up with much better immunity system, perhaps, and that's it. That's the end of the story. But we don't know the end of it. And that should make us pause, discuss, and think as hard as we can, because this is our time to decide the future of life. So we need to go there. We need to inform this coast, propose, and engage as large portion of the community as possible. England has been a leader in innovation in biomedical approaches. And it has been there because they engaged the community for many, many years. And I think we will be dumb if we don't do the same. And so it's up to all of us who have now heard the power of these to make sure that we use it for great things. And we go to the next moon with CRISPR, right? And we don't misuse it. So recently, there's been a big effort to try to engage at least the scientific communities to try to discuss this and put the pause. And while at the time that this was planned, there had been no intervention in human embryos. Before the meeting happened, the first one had been reported. By now, the count keeps growing. There's more than 10 on the go, right? And its use is really wild. I've shown you all of those species in which it has been tried, and it's probably in many more that I didn't manage to know. So I would like to just close with that, and thank you for your attention and hope you'll think about how we could use it for the benefit of humanity. And thank you. Thank you, Martine, for a great, great talk. I learned some new stuff, even though we've used CRISPR in my lab. Um, I'd now like to open up the floor to any questions that the audience might have. If you'll please come to the, on either side, there'll be the science ambassadors with the microphone, so if you can please come up to the microphone. Um, this is being recorded, so we will repeat the question from the audience <coughs> member, um, and then Martine will, will answer it. Uh, while we're waiting for people to gather their thoughts, I thought I would make a, a, a comment when I've often thought about uh, CRISPR, et cetera, and other new technologies. Um, I'm reminded in the 1970s with recombinant DNA when we were first able to put different genes, a human gene, into bacteria. The first human gene that was put into bacteria was actually the insulin gene. So you might say, why do you want to put a human gene into bacteria? Well, the point is, is that bacteria, they have all that machinery that Martine discussed to make the RNA and make the proteins, and the bacteria can make lots and lots of insulin. That then can be provided to diabetics. Before we had recombinant DNA technology, patients' diabetics would have to get insulin from either a dog or a human cadaver. Um, Nonetheless, even as exciting as it was, there was a pause in the 1970s. I remember I was in college at the time. Scientists did a self-imposed pause to say, hey, let's take a minute to think about recombinant DNA technology. They thought about it for a couple of years, and they said, no, just because you put the insulin gene into a bacteria does not make that bacteria a human, right? And so now we express hundreds of thousands of different genes in bacteria, and they're the, for the basis of a lot of different pharmaceutical uh, properties. So I'm looking for some people to come to the microphones to ask any questions. 
We have one person coming up. Hello, um, thank you for a very informative and wonderful talk. Um, I have two questions. Um, the first was um, you mentioned, you know, diseases that can, you know, diseases that can be corrected using uh, this CRISPR technology. So I was wondering um, whether or not there were, um, you know, ways to control what tissues were affected. So you mentioned Huntington's, and that affects primarily the nervous system. So you probably don't want that to be, you know, systemic, you know, entirely, you know, through the whole body. So are there ways to control where this, you know, where this affects the, uh, um, you know, where, where, where it produces effects in the so body? So the, the question regarding Huntington, I think, if I understand correctly, is that how do you deliver the treatment just to the tissue or organ affected, right? And in this case, it's a mutation that affects the function of that particular protein that is only expressed there. And so the idea is to go and modify the mutation that normally occurs in patients that carry that. And you could do this by screening the embryos before they're born. It's going to be much more difficult to conceive how we're going to go into the brain and modify that late. But the notion is that the same way that we do in vitro fertilization today and we screen for healthy babies, you could start determining what is the status regarding a series of diseases that we know of that are carried by a mutation in one gene. And if you have that possibility to know, which we do, right, we've used it to select gender, right? There's like 60,000 babies of IVF babies a year, right? So if you can monitor and sequence the genome of these embryos before you implant them, then you could also go and modify them. And in fact, the first four papers on human embryo modification have done so, right? In very early stages, none of these embryos have been allowed to move further. But what they've shown is that you can effectively modify it. The first attempt that was done in China, uh, they succeeded in demonstrating that the technique can be applied. But from 80 embryos in which they tried, less than half of them actually were repaired. And those that were repaired also received many off-target uh, mutations so that the navigator system and the scissors were not that good. That was the first one. It's three years later. And now we have much better systems and we know that it's feasible. So the question is not whether we can do it, it's whether we should do it. Um, and my second question is a little more, is less scientific, probably a little more, you know, kind of social. Um, and, you know, as a professor at UCR, you know, the, you, you probably work with a lot of undergrads and, you, you know, you're, I'm sure you're a fantastic educator. So what I want to know is, I guess, um, what role do academics and, you know, just people in the general community have about communicating, you know, like you said, this responsibility that we have, like, you know, with this technology that can be used in different ways? what role we have. Yeah, just as educators or as You're as seeing it here to begin with, right? Yeah. And you engage. Whenever you learn something, that's the beauty of the universities, of the academia, and I would say of the human curiosity, right? It's a natural quality of humans, right? So you get excited about something, and you share it, you discuss it, and you grow with the discussion, right? I have to acknowledge that I learn a ton through this experience, right? And I thought I was already very versed on CRISPR. Right, thank you very much. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Let's try it. We got several people lined up, so we'll initially leave it to one question per person. So let's go to the side of the room, please. All right. Hey, uh, my question has to do with the mosquitoes that you're Can you talking speak about? up a little louder? Okay, sorry. A little closer? All right. So my question was about mosquitoes. So you, you were talking about you could use CRISPR-Cas9 to get rid of the malaria gene in the mosquitoes, right? And that way people might not get infected and get malaria. Right? Uh -huh. That's the idea. Um, my question is, if you get rid of that, you kind of touched on this, but I just want to understand more fully. Um, if you get rid of that malaria gene, would that lower, say, the fitness of the organism, for example? L lower like, the? The fitness. Like the fitness. Make it we don't know. So let's just make one strategic way to do it. In order for the virus to infect, 
it needs to engage with proteins on the membrane, right, and then introduce a neck and then inject its DNA. Can we modify the proteins that are in charge of the enga initial engagement of the virus, or introduction, introduction of the neck, or injection of the DNA, right? So there's several components. If you modify those, let's say that you modify a, a protein on the membrane, will that alter the capacity of other virus to come in, or their bacteria, or, and, and this is just a speculation, right? But we don't know okay. what are the consequences. Okay, so this is kind of empirical at this point. No, they're very practical exercises towards malaria already. Okay. Okay. So, so I'll just repeat the question for the, the video recording. The question is, is um, what are the um, considerations and complications of altering a malaria gene in the mosquito genome? Let me just clarify, malaria is not a gene. Okay, it's from yeah. a plasmodium, yeah, no, it's from a plasmodium, it's from a parasite, and it, the bacteria then carry that parasite, and then they, when they bite us, they infect that parasite into us. Um, so uh, the question would be to, there's the, you could modify the mosquito so that they could no longer carry that mm -hmm. plasmodium, okay. right? But okay. great question, great question. Okay, thank you, thank you. Uh, do we have a question from over here? Uh, yeah. Uh, my question was uh, like, what are some, what are the, what would happen like for, what are the ethical issues and potentials of abuse while using CRISPR? Okay, so the question was, what are the ethical issues and potentials for abuse of using CRISPR? To begin with, ethically, I think one of the major concerns for most people is that you're doing a modification in somebody without their consent. Right? If you think that you're going to do it in an embryo, it doesn't have a saying. It's just going to receive your decision to modify it. Right? But you could go to many other angles on this and think of what has happened with previous advances in technology that allows to help some people. While it's really uh, appreciated that we have developed technologies, sometimes they're too expensive for everybody. Right? Yeah. So we need to think ethically and morally, whether it's going to reach everybody and whether what we're going to do was wanted, welcome, and it has a good outcome. I hope this answers at least partially yeah. your question, Perfect. but I hope we'll have a much better discussion about this on the last session. Yeah, thank you. And I'll, I'll just add that we discuss the same thing in cancer biology. That's true for any medical treatment. There's always the question of, is it going to be accessible to everybody at the same rate? Um, so over on this side. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Daisy Ocampo. I'm a um, PhD candidate in the history department, and I just want to say thank you for your presentation. Um, I learned a lot. One of the questions I had was about um, CRISPR going into the market and it getting patented and in terms of accessibility, cost, and all this good stuff. So that's uh, along the lines of my question. Thank you. Okay, so the question was whether or not CRISPR is patented, which I actually, I don't know their answer, but hopefully Martin does, um, <laughs> yeah. about it going into the market and following up on this question of is it gonna be accessible to people? So there's uh, at least two big fights between the University of California, Berkeley, the group of uh, Jennifer Dutna, who was the, Dutna, who was the first one uh, to at least submit a patent for the system, and MIT that submitted a little bit later, but I think they paid a premium to get theirs expedited, which is absolutely legal, by the way, it's not abnormal. <laughs> but theirs got in first, and there's some differences in the language that have complicated the things. To what extent just saying that you could use CRISPR applies for everything or not, or whether you have to be specific about where you're gonna use it. So they've been entangled in this major battle for the last, uh, I think, the first patent was filed in 2012. So you can do the math, right? So it's six years on that battle, and apparently Europe is leaning to the Dodna team, and the United States so far has validated uh, the East Coast uh, patent, um, but both teams are licensing the use of CRISPR for a wide range of, of applications. Uh, over on this side. Hi, my name is Ani. I'm a 
first year master's candidate in the School of Public Policy here at UCR, and I just want to say thank you. This is a great um, lecture. I learned a lot. Um, and so my question is, uh, what role do you view CRISPR playing in renewable energy and food resources in the coming future? And is there any research being done in this specific area of the field? So, so the question was from a master's student in School of Public Policy. I'd like to acknowledge that the previous one was done by a PhD candidate in history, so we've got, I love this wide range. And so then the question again was what? Here, I'll, I'll, I'll renewable, 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 renewable sources. Yeah, yeah. Food, How is it being renewable used for sources. renewable Sorry. sources? Yeah. Okay. I need some CRISPR on my brain. All right. And so I think it's, uh, I need to admit my ignorance. I don't know if there's a specific effort to use it in that regard. What I can tell you is that it's being used to improve food generation, right? To make it cheaper and to make it grow faster. Does that mean renewable sources? No. Biofuels? Well, people have modified bacteria for a long time for many different uh, purposes, um, either to try to diminish the damage of leaks of oil, for example. One of the first, actually, that's the first patent ever filed in an organism, right? Bacteria that could eat um, oil faster, like four times faster than the wild type. But I actually don't know of specific efforts for renewable sources. Okay. Yes. Sorry. So the, the, uh, the lecture a week from today will be focusing mainly on plants and, and food. Um, okay, on the, on the other side? We have a question? Uh, yes, hi, my name is uh, Devin Braslaw, um, and this is my partner, uh, Alex Kobian. And uh, we go to John W. North High School. Uh, first off, we'd like to say thank you again for the very informative uh, talk. Our bio teacher um, wanted us to come out and just get, uh, get the feel on how like, the college lectures are like, and, and we were really informed, and it, it was great. Uh, the question we have is, with this new Cas9 technology, uh, what do you see the future of of, of genes and uh, genomes in general, like what, what, do you, what do you see for 20 years from now from the road, like this new advancement in the technology, what do you see? Okay, so we had a question, from, a question from North High School, two students, that's wonderful. The first part they said this is a great lecture. Um, I want to say that every lecture at UCR is as good as this one, okay? <laughs> no, that's not true, they're much better. I'm not a good example, yeah. they're much better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then the, the, the real question was, um, how, does, um, how do you see the technology, let's say, 20 years from now? So it's difficult to see where it's going to go. I can tell you that it would be fantastic to prevent several of the diseases that afflict a lot of people. I think it's going to happen in embryos that are going to be born, without a doubt. I don't know to what degree we're going to push on that. And if it's to prevent a disease that is clearly well understood, then it's absolutely OK. But in something like Huntington's, where, Huntington disease, where I think we know the cause, we don't know what's going to be the consequence of tampering with that sequence. If the change could be just to repair to the wild type gene, perfect, right? But I'm concerned when we do this, are we going to start modifying other traits, right? And so while I think that the technology is going to allow us to fix a lot of things, I hope we understand that, that this thing is very fragile and that we should not tamper too much with it. That's what I hope. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. Uh, do we have a question on the side? Hello, I'm Angela. I'm also a high school student. I'm a junior um, attending my AP Bio class, and my AP Bio teacher wanted me to go out here, not just for extra credit, but also because it's like really interesting. <laughs> <laughs> extra credit is okay, nothing wrong with that. No, if she's out there, I mean, I'm not just going here for extra credit, it's also because it's Awesome, okay. Um, so uh, out of curiosity, I just wanted to ask, how would you go about utilizing CRISPR to treat um, diseases such as Down syndrome where there's like a presence of an extra chromosome? Okay, so th we have another um, high school junior in AP Bio asking how you'd go about using CRISPR to treat diseases where there's like an extra chromosome, I guess like uh, Down's disease or Down syndrome or, okay. Yes, uh, how would you use it when you're gonna, how to deal with an extra chromosome? It's a very uh, 
Good question and very difficult to answer. So you have a trisomy, you have many genes there that are overexpressed that cause an imbalance, right? And I think that if you are thinking of screening beforehand, you probably will not end up using that. And some people are choosing to do that, right? But thinking of CRISPR to be able to remove either the extra chromosome of the components on the extra chromosome that cause the condition, it's very hard at the moment. It's an enormous amount of DNA, right? I put like only six or eight bases of sequence, but our DNA is taller than me and fits in one cell, right? It has more than three billion bases, right? So to figure out what you need to do to remove from that extra chromosome so that it functions properly is very difficult to, to achieve. So, so also another way to look at it, you wouldn't be able to really easily get rid of that extra chromosome, so you'd have to engineer the, chrom the, the extra chromosome that's there to decrease the deleterious effect. But great question, great question. On the uh, other side here? Sorry, sorry, yeah. if, if I may, I was just thinking, so maybe what they can do is deliver things that will silence the whole chromosome. And that's actually not that done because part of the modifications on CRISPR are some proteins that don't go and cut the DNA, but that instead bring partners that repress everything or activate everything. So this could be a solution. I mean, I, I don't know if it's at hand, but at least theoretically you could think, okay, let's go and repress that one. How would you repress only that one and not the other two copies? That's a great question. Thank you. Okay. On the other side over here. Hi, Professor. Uh, first off, I'd like to uh, thank everyone who came here for the first part. Um, I just love to see how interdisciplinary this whole question panel has become. And I think it's really important going forward that we keep this degree of involvement. Um, so I hope you all stay seated because I have a thousand questions. But <laughs> I'm only going to choose one. And uh, Professor, that's kind of directed towards you and your research. I'm kind of interested in how CRISPR-Cas9 uh, is being incorporated into research here at uh, UCR, specifically your lab, if you could talk a, a bit about that. So the question is, is how is CRISPR-Cas9 being incorporated into research at UCR, and specifically Dr. Uh, Garcia Castro's research. Sure, um, we've uh, just started to play with it in a few ways, but what we want is to engineer cells so that, they, that we can learn how cells have the capacity to generate parts of the body, like your jaw, right? So we work with neural crest cells, and what we want to do is figure out which genes are essential, or which genes associated with cancers that are derived from the cells that we study, the neural crest cells. Which genes of the neural crest cells are activated during cancer? So we're trying to use CRISPR to uh, move faster in interrogating the function of genes associated with development in general. Thank you so much. Thank you. Question on the other side? Uh, how are you doing today, Professor? Thank you again for the talk. Um, just an average Joe here that came to see your lecture. Uh, thanks to our biology professor, but um, uh, my question is more on the ethical side. Now, as you mentioned, there's, there's a lot of problems with, you know, a lot of things to deal with on the ethical side, but specifically, you know, we're talking a lot about combating diseases and viruses. Uh, what would you, this, this question is going to be really cruel, I understand that, but uh, what would you answer to the individual that says, you know, what if by us combating so many viruses and diseases, we end up allowing the exponential gro population, growth of population on planet Earth to keep growing exponentially to the point where rather than us having to fight the, the, I guess the battles we have with CRISPR, now we start fighting the battles of, as you so mentioned, the very precious planet that we have of overpopulation and it just growing so much. Okay, so we have a great question from Average Joe, and I'd just like to say that, hey, the, the, the farther you are from a field, the best questions you ask, and that's a fabulous question. So. Let's say there's nothing wrong individually with the CRISPR editing, et cetera, but then we are so successful at it, we eliminate so many diseases, we now have way too large of a population, and then we induce other problems with water resources, et cetera. So I think this has been pictured in, in science fiction before. Uh, Brave New World, Blade Runner, both of them touch on these aspects, right? 
And we have to think about it, right? So one of the goals very clearly for researchers that are pushing for the editing of the human are to extend, expand human life. So is everybody gonna have access to it, right? So when they asked me what I envisioned for 20 years, I didn't say all the things that I would like, but I would like for this to be accessible to everybody, right? If that were to be the case, then are we gonna have to impose limitations on how many kids we could have until we really have run out of spaces, right? And it, it is very difficult to address if that were to happen. And you see that the population, the human population is growing in that direction without CRISPR. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I know I only have one question, but I forgot to mention, uh, just in your personal opinion, is it worth that risk uh, for us stopping the suffering of individuals, of certain individuals that are suffering from horrible diseases? So, so the question is, does, um, is it worth the risk is it worth the risk of eliminating the suffering from individuals versus the consequences it have on the population uh, in general? Again, it's a big moral dilemma. If it's a close kin that you care for, you're going to say absolutely. I, I find very hard to believe that people are going to say, no, don't use this to help my dear loved one. Um, there might be some people that, that sacrifice their feelings for the rest of humanity and to a way we need to discuss it so that everybody agrees on how far we're going to go. Thank you. So, I appreciate so these, it. Thank these you. are great questions. Not at all specific to CRISPR, but important questions. Okay. Next question. Hi. Uh, my name is Winston Liu. Um, I'm a physician and I just um, am concerned. I mean, we've seen quite a bit of more um, can, cases. Can you get a little closer to the microphone, oh, please? Is that better? Yeah. Yes, uh, I'm just concerned because um, we're seeing cancer um, occurring at an early age and of course the type 2 diabetic. And the fact of the matter is um, a lot of our food that we have in this country, processed food, I mean, are genetically engineered. I mean, the corn, the wheat, and so forth, as well as um, salmon. So long-term wise, do you have any concern about the long-term effect of um, these foreign DNAs that are genetic engineered to, of course, in increase the agricultural yield? But at what expense, long-term-wise, can we expect? So I mean, the, the question from the physician is, what about uh, genetically modified organisms, corn, wheat, salmon, and how do we um, uh, take that into consideration? I think I... I'm gonna leave, let Martine answer very briefly, and then I'm gonna refer you to the next lecture when we're gonna talk about plants and food, et cetera, and specifically. So I, I think that as we continue to explore this, we will do better, right? I read a recent report that suggested that simply farm salmon, so it's not modified, just farm salmon has a very different competence, capacity, versus wild salmon. And so are we eating a very different animal? Is that gonna cause any damage to us or not? I think as we gain more knowledge, we will do it better. The thing is, we have more than six billion people in the planet. And it's not fair for me to say, I'm very happy going to Sprouts and Trader Joe's and buy everything I want for very little, while there's people in Africa that have no access to the food. Right? So if these technologies will help us, I mean, some of the first modifications allow growth on uh, drier climate, for instance, right? Putting food in the table of some people that would not have had the chance otherwise. Yeah. So there's a lot more questions here. We're not gonna be able to have time to answer them all. Um, I'm gonna allow two more questions, and could you please have be specific to CRISPR? As you see, we have three more lectures coming up, and we can uh, delve into some of this uh, elsewhere. So we'll have one more question from this side and one more question from that side, and please keep it specific to CRISPR, particularly in humans, because uh, that's uh, Martine's expertise. Um, hi, my name is Blake Pricer, and I, uh, my question was, is it possible for CRISPR uh, to uh, fix uh, neurological like dis uh, disabilities such as TREDS, dyslexia, or um, autism? Okay, so is it possible for CRISPR to fix neurological disabilities such as Tourette's, um, dyslexia, and Alzheimer's? Autism. 
Autism. I've got Alzheimer's. Autism. Thanks. Okay. So I, I think it's hopefully yes. It's out of reach at the moment. Most of these complex behavioral capacities, competences of human are, are beyond our reach, right? So if it's a disease in which we know that there's one gene that is culprit, we can repair that one. But we cannot map out how you make a thought, right? And so the social context of an individual is super complex for our understanding, our current understanding, to try to go and help with it. So, so, so great question. We need to know more about the basics of those disease. All right, and one last class question. Hi, so you mentioned that there were ethical issues involved with the use of CRISPR. Uh, I was wondering if there's any legislation from the government regarding the use of uh, CRISPR and other gene editing tools. Okay, so the question is, is uh, considering all these ethical considerations, is there new legislation coming out from the government um, to regulate CRISPR? So p partially, right? Because there's some things that at least if you're funded by the U.S. government, you're not allowed to do, but only partially, right? There's others that are allowed. So for the previous person that made a question asking about uh, GMOs, well, they, there was a uh, decision of the current government suggesting that you could use CRISPR to modify plants, agro in general, right? Um, it just happened last week, I think. Um, but, but this is all over the world, and the world is doing it. Okay, I, so I think with, with that, we're going to stop. I want to thank everybody again. Thank you. The speaker, as well as the great questions. Please, please come to April 12th. We'll con con continue this discussion, April 19th, and then May, I think it's May 10 or May 11. Okay? Thank you all for attending. It's wonderful participation.